Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Senior JavaScript Developer. My name is Steve Olson. And have you ever wondered why machines like this are designed with numerous small parts? What possible benefit could a bunch of small pieces that can break and get lost offer? And how does this topic relate to developing code at a senior level? Well, I'm really excited for this episode because up to now, I've mostly talked about intangible concepts around becoming a senior JavaScript developer. But today, I finally get to talk about two of my most favorite tech fives, that's right, techniques for building maintainable code, both on the front end and the back end. So the connection with said diagrams and coding is that all good machines and systems are designed to be understandable, constructible, testable, composable, and replaceable. The first machines were built only to be functional, but users soon got really mad because one area would break down and it would cause the entire system to be discarded. And today, it's entirely possible to write software system components in the same monolithic, inlined way as yesteryear. But as senior developer, we want and we need to write software that is also understandable, constructible, testable, composable, and replaceable for all the same reasons and benefits as machines. Now, can you think back to a time where you learned something that caused a paradigm shift, even though it might have been incredibly simple, like stupid simple? That experience happened to me in a profound way several years ago while I was learning jQuery. I know, I've dated myself. I watched a YouTube video of a conference speaker who showed some code that looked kind of like this. This is classic jQuery. Or something like this. A little more small for demonstration purposes. And then he asked, how do you test this? Well, I was kind of stunned and quickly thought, who cares? I can see that it works from his demo. And it did work. It was functional, but it wasn't testable. So then he said, this is how you test it. Do you know what he did? He did this. And then something like this. And then even something like this. But the point is he extracted an inline function up to a top level which makes all the difference for testability and composability in a system. This revelation blew my mind. It blew my mind, and since that day, I've always been trying to notice the ways that I write foot gun code, that's code that shoots you in the foot, and then think about how I can refactor it better. So, extraction is one of the most productive and useful techniques for refactoring when it's done right. There are still no silver bullets, but the technique I'm going to show you via React hooks in this context is based on the principle of extraction over inline. You'll see what I mean, don't worry. So, without further ado, let's dive into the sample code. All right, so here we are with our very simple application to demonstrate how to decompose components. Um, it's an application with just a single web component that we're going to take a look at, as you can see here. Just a simple div that wraps component number one, and we'll look at the second version of this component in a moment. But let's go ahead and open up index for component v1 to see how we've implemented this. All right. 
as you can see, as we look at the top of our component, we are importing two hooks from React, useState and useRef. So we already know this component is going to have some kind of state associated with it. Now let's take a look here at some simple logic. We are using state in order to track something called a counter, a very typical React example, and also using a ref here, um, just because I wanted to show some logic that was a little bit more complex and also tied into the template or the, the JSX. So we're tracking the username ref, which is an input I'll show you down below. Uh, some simple logic here, just to say that if the counter is less than zero, we want to keep counter always a uh, positive integer or zero. So if it's less than zero, which could happen if in here in the props, the start counter um, was passed in as a negative number, that's not something we want to handle in our component, and I'll show you why in a second. Um, counter is really used as the minimum length. Over here in our component, you can notice it starts out as a length of one, and um, basically, when we click this button, you'll see the length increases. Very simple state management. And over here, uh, that counter is used to say, if it's greater than the length of the username, then uh, we want to show a warning. So what that means is, uh, I'll show you a really simple example here. Uh, I have a min length of five right now. So if I type a name that is only three characters, and I hit add, you see I'm going to get a length warning here because one, two, three, that's only a length of three characters long. Um, doesn't matter whether it's that or that. <clears throat> so you see these don't match. Um, it has to be a minimum length of seven. Right now it's four, so I'm getting this warning. That's how the logic work works for this component. Um, and that's what this show warning is computing. It's a Boolean to say whether or not we should show this very simple H4. And then that H4, as you can see, gets displayed down here below our button that says add. Um, getting a little bit ahead of myself. So the component starts with an H1, an H3. This is representing the monolith architecture. We'll look at the alternative in a moment. Um, we're displaying our counter here, and when the button gets clicked, we're doing a very simple set counter, increment it by one, and we are also consoling log. We don't need to do that. It's not too useful, but we'll keep it there for now. And the rest is, is pretty standard React. You'll see here we're wiring in the ref into our input. So this username ref is what we're using that ref hook for here use ref. Okay, and that begins as null until it's actually wired into the uh, input down here. So that's the component. Now, <clears throat> I've indicated a little bit of um, comments here to say, typically in a React component, this is how it's set up. Uh, you start with the business logic at the top, and then below you're returning some JSX, which is what we'll call the template for this demonstration. So we've got business logic at the top, template below. Now the question becomes, this is all working fine and dandy, but the million dollar question is, how do I test this? And the answer is, it's very difficult. Um, without using a library like test library, or testing library, excuse me, um, to render your component into a virtual JS DOM, and then poke it, um, click it, and check the virtual DOM to look for certain components and what their values are. It's a little bit complicated. And that is because I'd argue that we're mixing two responsibilities in this component. One is business logic and the other is template. So let's look at an alternative to this architecture of a web component by opening up version two. Okay, so here I've opened up version two. Actually, what I'm gonna do is just display it on the page here so that we can see its functionality first, and then we will dive into the code in a second. As you can see, um, the components look very similar. The only difference, well, there's two differences. One is, this one is just identifying the component as using the use props technique, which I'll describe in a second. Um, it does begin with a min length of two, because as you can see, the component is initialized with a prop of start counter equals two and not one. 
But if I change this to one, it would work the same. Just do a little refresh here. And there we see it starts off as one, just like its other component. And I can click add the state changes. I can do this and see that warning. But if I make it longer, the warning goes away. So all that logic is still in place, which is awesome. OK, now let's dive into the version 2 component. And here we'll see, uh, I'll skip to the template part. Spoiler alert, this is actually almost identical. The only difference being uh, this label here to identify this component separately. But really, basically, the template is exactly the same as our version 1 component. So what's changed? Well, this use prop is a design pattern that allows us to extract all of the business logic out of the web component and put it into a React hook. And let's take a really look, quick look at that, and then we'll explain why we'd want to do this. Um, now, you'll notice that this React hook is where we pull in some of the React hooks, use state and use ref. And you can almost mentally you know, map this in your mind to the business logic from component number one, just pulled into its own separate space, its own, sep its own separate function, if you will. And it's doing the same stuff. So use state counter, use ref, and it's doing a, a check for the counter to uh, make sure it's not negative. It's also computing the show warning boolean um, based off of some simple logic. And then it's just returning all of that computation and those results in that state, everything back as an object into the container component or the template component here. And that's what we're deconstructing here. So really, it's just abstracted the business logic into a place. Now, why would we do that? And I argue that the really good reason for this is, well, one, it makes the code a little bit more readable because you can open up this component. And if you know you need to change something um, to the uh, template, it's a lot less lines to go through. So that's one benefit. Uh, the other benefit, though, is for testing purposes, which is a really, really big deal. That's not just like, well, testing. It's no, if something is easier to test, we should be writing it that way. So le let me show you what I mean. Let's go back here for a quick refresher. We're looking at this logic and thinking, huh, what do I need to test? I know it works, but I don't. I want to be able to detect bugs if they're introduced into this code as you know, we're adding new features as we are wont to do and um, be able to identify problems uh, immediately running unit tests. So the way that we can do that is I've written a sample unit uh, unit test suite here in this in this file using jest and so I've got my describe block here it's describing use props by the way using these labels makes it really easy to detect where code has broken if a test should fail so I highly recommend this structure uh, it's sort of like a hierarchy so at the top we have what's being tested and this is our use props um, hook. I'm aliasing it as target, just again as another common convention for tests. Uh, it makes them very easy to read. Once I know what a test suite is testing, I can call that as target, and then I reference target. You'll see later on in my tests everywhere. But target represents use props. I am clearing all my mocks at the end of each test, which is also very important to keep our tests running independently from one another. And I'm setting up a bunch of hooks, and I'll explain those in a minute. But down here, you can see this is how I am running my tests. So I'm testing the business logic of my component here. And the test describes it should not show warning. Maybe a little more human readable would be nice. But the idea here is if I have a target counter set as 4, um, then I'm not going to be showing a warning because I forgot to show you this initially. But this line is very important where I'm mocking the use ref hook from React. And what I'm doing here is pretending 
that I'm always going to have the value of fake. So that what that means is I'm pretending that somebody's typed in fake here into the uh, input. That is my string, and so that is a that is a length of four. And I've decided just to leave that hard coded for now uh, to make it more dynamic. I I could certainly um, create a way to to change that in each of my tests, but for now it's okay. I'm just leaving it as fake. So when fake is length of four and counter is four, uh, I'm not going to show a warning label, and that is the case here. And so you can see it's a very simple test. I'm not rendering anything to the DOM because I don't need to. I'm just testing a function, and I'm testing the results, which again is that returned object here. So input output testing. And it's almost, this target has actually almost become a pure function, which we all know are much easier to test than um, side effect functions. And the reason I say it's a pure function is because we are mocking all of its dependencies, which means we have full control over how this function is going to react um, to inputs. Although it's, it's not a classic pure function, I grant you that. Um, nonetheless, we can think about it that way because it's mocked um, properly. So let's take another example of a test. It should show warning. So now I'm setting my start counter to 5. Remember, we know the text length is 4. And so we expect the show warning property to be true, which in turn would mean, um, so if I have that to 5, or well, actually that's not quite right. This would be 5, and this would be a length of 4, but you get the idea. Um, show warning would show this uh, in the component in the on the template side. Before we go to an advanced use, let me run through the way that I've mocked the React hooks, use state and use ref. So here I've used um, a mock hook option uh, object, excuse me, with these keys that I can choose to overwrite later. But essentially I'm I'm mocking the way that use state normally works. So use state is a function. I pass in an initial state and it returns an array. That array returns at item zero, the initial state, and at item one, uh, a function that uh, I can use to set the state uh, next time. Same thing for use ref. I'm use ref is a function, so I'm mocking a function. And it returns an object with a key called current, which points to another object, which has a property called value, which is fake. And so these are my mocks for the two hooks. And then I'm wiring them into Jest to say, Jest, I want you to spy on the React use state hook when it's being brought in as a dependency. And here's your mock implementation using the mock hooks use state, which I just described up here, right? Same for use ref, and that's how we wire it into the system. Now, what I can do there is with the advanced just test that I've defined here, is I can start to change these a little bit because I want to change their behavior to say, well, on the first time you call use state, I want you to act like a normal um, use state, just return you know initial state, yada yada. The second time you call it. I'm going to want you to return an initial state plus one. And that kind of symbolizes or fakes a button click, because I know this test is going to try twice um, the initial render, and then once I've clicked on a button is the second time. So the way that I simulate that is now by calling target and passing in a number four. And I do some expectations on the result object. So counter is 4, and show warning is false. Now when I call target a second time, this is going to be like a re-render of the component. This actually no longer really matters, because my mock implementation on the second run returns the initial state, which is 4 plus 1, which is 5. And so that will set the counter to be 5, and now my show warning will be set to true. So let's just poke our head back into use props and see what we're talking about. So use state was mocked, 
and initially it's going to return whatever start counter was, so counter will be four. The second time I call target, I've mocked use state to return four plus one, or start counter plus one. So this is four, it's gonna return plus one, and counter is going to be five. Okay, so again, that's what I'm doing here. It's not complicated once you understand what's going on, you just have to understand the power that you get with just mocks and just spies. Uh, it's pretty awesome. And then same thing for this advanced. Um, I can check whether set counter fake was called at all. I'm going to pass it in uh, a negative one. And so what I'm testing now is this logic here, just to make sure that my counter is never negative because it doesn't make sense. And so if counter is ever negative, I know that set counter is gonna get called. And my test here is wiring up this set counter fake with a just uh, mock function, which I can then use to detect when it's being called. So this is what gets passed back by use state uh, the first time. And then I'm gonna pass in negative one. So I, I expect this logic to trigger because counter is less than zero, negative one is less than zero. And so I know set counter, which was passed back by use state, is going to get called. And in this test, that's all that I'm testing is that set counter fake was called. I could also test to see what it was called with. I would expect it to be a zero in this case, right? Um, I haven't done that here, but I could. Um, and this, this works great, and I've tested my logic. One word of warning here, I guess, is to be careful about how often we are testing the internals of how things work inside of uh, any function, really. Um, because if internal implementations start to break, um, it's often a pain to fix tests. And really, we should be asking ourselves, well, maybe I just want to care about the result of you know, what this thing is, what this function is passing back, and not so much how it's doing it inside. So I tend not to test very many just mock functions like I'm doing here, just because it's annoying to fix tests when their implementation breaks. Let me give you a really simple example about that. If I decided that I didn't want to call set counter here, um, because of rendering uh, concerns, like set counter does not get called immediately, as many people know, which means counter for a very brief nanosecond, this is still going to be that negative number um, returned from the function, and then React immediately calls set counter and kind of squares things up for us. But initially, counter is very temporarily a negative number, and uh, maybe I decide I don't want that. So instead of instead of protecting us against counter this way, um, maybe I'll I'll comment this out, and I'll do something like counter equals you know math dot max of zero or counter. And this is another way of just protecting myself from getting negative values that were you know passed in. Um, I could also do both. You know, I have the option as a programmer, as the developer, to decide how I want to protect myself against negative counters. But the point is, is that if I choose not to do this, suddenly my tests are going to break. And let me show you an example of that. Um, Code Sandbox has this really cool feature where I can click on the test tab here, and it will look through all my files that are called .test.ts and you'll see that this one has failed now because I've changed my implementation. If I uncomment this test, or uncomment this change to use props, we'll let the test suite run. And Code Sandbox crashed, so I had to restart my browser. And here we go again. Let's try running the tests one more time. Oh, 
and it's running the tests, and now they all pass. Again, because my implementation was as my test expected. So I hope that this helped you understand the benefits of using the design pattern of use props in order to extract the business logic out of your web component and into a function that you can test and you don't need to render into any virtual DOM in order to test it. Also, this is, I would argue, more reusable. So if in the future, for example, you wanted to move away from React and use another templating language or framework of some kind, it would be much easier to rewrite all of that rendering logic or templating logic in, let's say, a new framework. It could be Svelte or Vue or uh, SolidJS, what, what have you. Um, that would still require some work for sure. But it'd be a lot easier, in my opinion, to reuse a lot of the business logic. For example, you wouldn't have access to any of these React hooks anymore, but you could probably find something very similar in that new framework that you're using to just swap them out here, and then you have all of the same logic here. Um, so that's a really great way to future-proof yourself a little bit from having to rewrite your whole application Big Bang style um, when the next new Shiny framework comes out. And that is it. I hope that you really enjoyed this session on how to extract business logic and create those little parts that are more testable and more reusable. Thanks for joining me, and I will see you on the next session. Take care.